So I want to now bring on Amelia, and in this talk, Amelia Winger Bearskin will present the project Wampum.codes and explore creating playful experiences with AI, VR, and sound. Um, Amelia is coming to us from Sacramento, and I'm just going to read a little introduction, her bio before we get started. Amelia Winger Bearskin is an artist technologist who helps communities leverage emerging technologies to affect positive change in the world. She's a developer evangelist at Contentful in the S uh, San Francisco Bay Area. She founded Idea New Rochelle, which partnered with the NR Mayor's Office to develop citizen-focused VR and AR tools, and was awarded the 2018 Bloomberg Mayor's Challenge $1 million grant to prototype their AR citizen toolkit. She's a Google VR jumpstart creator, co-directing with Wendy Red Star, a 360 video story about Native American monsters, which was selected for a MacArthur grant through the Sundance Institute Native New Frontiers Story Lab in 2018. Uh, Amelia was a professor of time-based media art and performance at Vanderbilt University for five years before returning to her roots in New York City creative technology, graduating from NYU's interactive telecommunication communications program in 2015. Uh, in 2016, she went on to found and direct the DBRS Innovation Lab, an applied research lab that specialized in developing creative uses of artificial intelligence and machine learning technologies. Amelia is also the founder of Stupid Hackathon, which y'all were just talking about actually in the, in the little chat we had beforehand, um, which now holds events around the world. She's a fellow of the Sundance New Frontier Story Lab, a Sundance Institute Time Warner Fellow, and in 2018 was awarded the Engadget Alternative Realities Prize for her VR experience, Your Hands or Feet, which is the first time I came across Amelia's work with Your Hands or Feet. I was in the studio of her collaborator, Sarah Rothberg. Um, and a couple more things. Uh, in 2016, she was part of an Oculus Launchpad Fellow and an artist in residence at Pioneer Works. And her art is part of the permanent collection of the Guggenheim Museum the McCord, and the McCord Museum. Amelia is a Hanunasani Iroquois of the Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma Deer Clan. And Amelia is founder and host of Wampum.Code's podcast and the host of Contentful plus Al Agoria's developer podcast, DreamStacks. So without further ado, here is Amelia. My name is Amelia Winger Bearskin. Uh, thank you so much for having me speak today. I would like to share with you some of my work. I am Seneca Cayuga Nation of Oklahoma Deer Clan. I, that means I'm indigenous um, on my mother's side. And uh, we are part of the Iroquois, or as we like to call ourselves, the Haudenosaunee, uh, which are the six nation people of the Longhouse. We're a Confederate uh, democracy. Um, I would love to share with you a little bit about my practice, both with uh, a term that I've coined called antecedent technology and decentralized storytelling. Um, decentralized storytelling really comes from the way in which uh, I grew up learning about my own oral history of my culture. My mom is a traditional storyteller for our tribe, which means that she gathered and collected the stories um, from the elders within our culture and shared them um, through performance at at uh, universities, festivals, museums, um, and also became someone who, who was a scholar and shared stories with other indigenous people all around the world. Uh, when I was growing up, I would perform with her with flutes or drums or other type of our traditional instruments to, um, because our storytelling is actually multifaceted. It's why I call it decentralized, not just because it is decentralized within a multitude of different types of media, like uh, visual media that might take the form of tattoos or these same, uh, images may be on our pottery or our beading or on um, it, it, instruments in, in ceremony or objects within ceremonial traditions. Um, it also, our storytelling is embedded in the landscape. It's connected to nature and to our animals. It's decentralized as a strategy to make it so that the wisdom 
that we have, the dependencies that are part of this architectural code of our community to build a lasting peace and democracy, you need to abstract things in a way that you can communicate to future generations. We have a concept um, where anything that I'm doing now is the result of the seven generations before me, and anything that I do will have a lasting impact on the seven generations in front of me. But that also means that the information that I learn, something that I may add to this chain needs to be clear, it needs to be abstracted, and it needs to also contain the multitudes of wisdom that I have learned without corrupting this information, right? So I think of it um, very much, you know, since I am a, a technologist, um, I am a Mozilla fellow uh, embedded at MIT's co-creation studio with Kat Sizak. I'm also a developer evangelist for the startup Contentful. And my work as a technologist has helped me also understand um, the, the cultural value and um, contributions indigenous people have and be able to communicate it with other technologists as well. If you're going to take whatever you made in code this week, maybe let's say, and communicate that to someone seven generations in the future. What would you need to include in that information? You might need to say what the thing you're doing is for, what its dependencies are. It might need something like a computer in order to run. And you'd have to explain what a computer is to those people who may, may, the technology may be so incredibly different in the future. But really, you would need to explain to them why these things mattered and how they're important and what types of values you hoped to engage with in order to make the world a better place. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about the projects that I've been doing um, in virtual reality uh, with software development and co-creation and also the podcast that I created called Wampum.codes where I interview indigenous technologists um, about all the really amazing things they're doing uh, with their own communities. So. Thank you very much for having me today. There is that really crazy sound effect when the giant's leg gets shaved. That's this really strange sponge that I bought that's the worst sponge ever. Like, it's so bad at scrubbing dishes. And we sat there and we were listening to it and we were like, this is, this is the sound of shaving a giant's leg. This is perfect. I started out kind of my creative career as a writer and I was I was really interested in kind of experimental writing that leverage different um, aspects of new technologies. So I got to this point where I was like, it's really fun to think about technology and how it's impacting us, but I would really rather be working directly with the technologies. I went to a grad program called ITP and I learned how to code. In my last year of grad school, VR suddenly came onto the scene as like, something that was going to be accessible for us to use. You know, Sarah was the first person I had met as an artist who was just working in VR in a more playful way. We just started brainstorming and thinking of moments when you virtually give someone a piece of your life, like in, in daily life. If I'm talking to Sarah and I'm trying to explain to her how I felt that morning or what I was thinking about the future, very frequently we prototype those kinds of experiences with sayings or with metaphors. So I can say like, I walked into that room and my stomach just dropped, or it was so like loud that I felt like my ears were bleeding. Your Hands or Feet is a VR experience. It's an interactive exploration of new metaphors. The experience starts off where you're in kind of this surreal looking kitchen and you have in front of you a half dozen carton of eggs and inside of each egg is contained an experience that has some kind of psychologically complex action to it that we hope acts as something that you think back on and you're like, wow, this is such a strange feeling. It kind of reminds me of, for instance, like that time that I felt like my hands were feet. I don't know, I feel like my mind is a confusing machine. 
what we're really doing here is we're creating these metaphors that like maybe don't exist but might apply in a situation as like the perfect way to describe this thing. In the beginning, I started with a basic treatment, so I created a lot of 3D assets to just sort of mock up this world, sort of the look and feel. And we came up with this idea of having it be like a half dozen experiences from, you know, a half egg carton and how we would move from each, each space. Landing on the visuals for any project is an interesting process. You know, you have to make something that feels true to something that you like, but it also has to be something true to what the other person likes. Sarah said she had this amazing friend, Neve Bavarsky, in LA, who was an uh, illustrator. We reached out to Neve and, you know, showed him all of the reference imagery, showed him our very tight color palette of what we were trying to go for. And we were like, can you do the Neve version of your hands or feet universe? And then from there, um, we were like, how are we going to put this thing together? Because translating from 2D into 3D seems easy, but to keep the same visual style is not always so straightforward. It made a lot of sense like for us to approach it with a style that's inviting and not like depressing or scary, but just a little bit scary, maybe. It's really helpful to like take those two concepts and then give it to one person that can execute that so that it stays really consistent. So we were like, let's try this tool, Medium, which is a 3D um, VR sculpting tool. And so we felt like, oh, this is perfect that we found this, this way to find like a slice of what we were interested in, a way that we can produce it in a really organic and fun way. And that's kind of how we landed on the visual style that we're at right now. A lot of our music is gonna be generative. So generative music is when you're really designing those whys, therefores, and ifs. You know, normally you listen to a song and it's got the beginning and the middle of the end and there's like nothing you can do about it. But in an interactive song, there's ways that you can alter parts of it so that way you're sort of participating with the music. Every object that you pick up is like contains an audio track. Depending on which objects you interact with, you're really flushing out what the soundscape of that environment is. Me and Sarah are doing all this work to create a really fun playground. We might have kind of serious concepts about the emotional resonance behind each of the interactions, which we have very long and engaged conversations about, like even the, the physicality of grabbing that object, to, that action has to be connected. So we want each of the interactions to also be analogous to a place in time that you might've had that feeling. When I look at it from an outside perspective, I'm like, a lot of these things have to do with frustration, but a lot of them also have to do with joy and feeling joy while doing something frustrating. And so I want to give people a moment where they can interact with that quality of VR, where they can say, this is an extension of my brain and my experience within the world. This isn't the real world. This is the computational amalgamation of human understanding in this world. And I want to give people an opportunity to interact with that and interface with that. When we explain it to people, they just get it and they're excited about it, even though it's like, um, oh, the, it's the, like an experience the, the where your hands are feet because don't you ever just feel like a weird feeling and you don't know how to describe it and it's like something you've never felt before? Well, isn't VR the perfect way to kind of explore that? And people are like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so that's been pretty surprising also. <laughs> and to film the sites where a lot of these monsters uh, were said to have been seen. And throughout the process, we ended up really discovering the meaning of what a monster is in our culture, which actually the word for the specific type of monster we were looking at in her tribe is also known as um, the little people or keepers of the land. And we started thinking about that relationship um, of like who is the monster and who is a monster because they're protecting the land. And we asked people at the end of this installation, um, would you be a monster with us? And um, the work that I've been doing this year is within a research framework called Antecedent Technology. Right now, I'm working on a project called Wampum.Codes. It's a project with Mozilla a foundation, a fellowship with embedded at MIT's uh, co-creation studio with Kat Sizak. And um, I've been working on the history of wampum and, and how that connects to software development and ethics and ethical dependencies in software development. And I'd like to read you a little statement that I wrote about that. 
If history was written by the victors, then the future will be written by the vectors. Artificial intelligence will radically change our world, our lives, our planet, and it remains to be seen if it will be a positive or a negative. If it's said that those who fail to study history are doomed to repeat it, I would add that those who ignore data have underfitted models. When Thomas Jefferson and Benjamin Franklin were looking for a new model to serve as a basis for the United States government, they were very impressed by the Iroquois Confederacy, we call ourselves the Haudenosaunee, people of the Longhouse, were made up of the Seneca, Cayuga, Oneida, Onondaga, Mohawk, and Tuscarora. Thomas Jefferson spent over a year with us in upstate New York in one of our largest cities. When Jefferson and Franklin and the other founding fathers drafted the U.S. Constitution, they cherry-picked the best parts that were most beneficial to their own political purposes, the bits that seemed to align the best with their Enlightenment-era ideology, representation, voting, checks and balances, etc. But they left out the social and cultural networks that sustained these practices in the actual Iroquois Confederacy. Well, what did they leave out? In the Iroquois Constitution, women, clan mothers from each tribe were the only ones who could vote for the representative who was always a man, a chief. Actually, the word for clan mother and chief is the same word. There was a balance of power. Only men could serve and only women could vote. Their economy was driven through complex agricultural arrangements. Everyone in the community participated in planting and harvesting. It was not an economy of slavery dependent plantation agriculture. This is an example of colonial mindset. I see it, I like it, I want it, I'll take it. I take it and I take what will benefit my own paradigm, but I'm unconcerned with the effect it will have being taken out of context and the effect it'll have on the people I take it from. This is like trying to run a program without checking its dependencies. What if it turns out that the Confederate democracy or lasting peace and prosperity is dependent upon a balance of power along gender lines? or upon a different economic model than the one practiced by European settlers in North America? Or what if it imagines a system of agriculture where the environment is protected and maintains sus sustainable practices? We all have colonial mindset, just because our culture has colonial mindset. But here's the thing, we're not colonial subjects and we don't have to live under a colonial empire anymore. In data science, we talk about models suffering from either overfitting or underfitting. Overfitting is when a model exhibits a low degree of bias, but a high degree of variance. In other words, it accepts a lot of differences within the data, but it doesn't have very much predictive power. Underfitting is the inverse of this, high bias, low variance. This is what happens when you make a generalization without enough data, or when the data is not diverse enough to represent the real world. The big problem with colonial mindset is one of underfitting, extracting idea without the context that made that idea work in the first place. I'm here to say, don't colonize our future. Our plans for the future need to include more data from diverse cultures and societies, and not only those ideas that flatter what we already think. For instance, let's say you want to lay the groundwork for a society run on the blockchain. What does that look like? How does that work? What are the consequences? If we don't have significant data, we might just have to wing it. But we actually have thousands of years of data about decentralized economies. The use of wampum, um, among the Iroquois functioned as a decentralized distributed ledger of contracts, and it helped us govern, govern our society for centuries. Wampum is an example of what I've termed antecedent technology, and there are many more cases like this. In South America, the Inca had a Turing complete system of knot tying called Kipu, which predated modern computing by hundreds of years. When we want to use powerful new technologies such as AI or blockchain, and we want as much data as we can to help us imagine positive change in the world, we do not need to throw out thousands of years of data that can fuel the next giant leaps our communities will make with technology. I want people to know that indigenous people had technologies that have solved complex issues. I want us to use their data to help us dream our future, and I want us to believe that just because we have had 500 years of slavery, worker exploitation, poverty, and gender imbalance, we have had thousands of years of peace, prosperity, and equality right here in the country where I'm standing right now. There's a ton of indigenous people working in AI and VR and cutting edge technologies. Um, you know, 
the internet has kind of a low barrier for entry, but also it's it's really where a lot of culture is happening right now with this prize. So um, yeah, so I started just talking to my friends about the cool stuff they're making and also the cool stuff they're not making because we're sheltering in place and having a lot of uh, time to think about our process and our heritage and our cultures. And uh, I'll let you guys hear a little bit of that. Hello, I'm Amelia Winger Bearskin, the host of Wampum.codes. Uh, we are brought to you with generous support from the Mozilla Foundation and the co creation studio at MIT. I interview native and indigenous artists, activists, technologists, entrepreneurs, inventors, and all around cool people. And I'll let our first guest of our very first podcast introduce herself. Great, yeah. Uh, well, my name is Asha Viraswamy. I am an indigenous uh, storyteller, creative director, and digital media producer that really focuses on AR, VR, and XR technologies and how we transition to those in, in the 21st century. My name is Erica Tremblay, or Ondawayesta is my Cayuga name. And I'm super happy to be here and talk with you today. I know, I know. I have like, you know, people always ask me, they're like, do you know any other Native American Jews? And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A lot of them. <laughs> There's like a few. I mean, uh, I think it's so funny. I get that all the time too. And uh, I grew up with a few. So it didn't seem so weird. Like I went to preschool at my temple and I feel like, Probably a third of my class was like little brown Jewish kids. That's so, amazing. <laughs> uh, but I also grew up in Santa Fe, New Mexico, so yeah. that's probably where you're going to find the majority of uh, Native American Jews. Wampum.codes, the podcast, is the first iteration of a project um, that I'm outlining to develop a model of ethical software dependencies, an attempt to inscribe community values and developer accountability into code. The way it works is as follows. Uh, an example is in my package.json, I have wampum.codes dependency, which makes it clear that this project I have created is free to use and that people can only use it and modify it in any way they want. Um, besides closed sourcing, uh, open sourcing already covers this use case. However, I have also encoded my own values. Uh, wampum.codes package.json um, dependency may look like this. And as you can see, it's formatted as a normal JSON file. I've borrowed a few terms from the domain of software development and repurposed them to help explain how an ethical dependency might be structured and what kinds of information it may contain. The following is a brief explanation of each term and how I use them. Um, I'm going to be writing more about this this week, and I encourage you to check out uh, Mozilla's uh, fellowship blog as well as the MIT co-creation blog um, for more information, or you can just go to my website studioamelia.com and I'll have the links there. Uh, I will have in there um, a sort of mini map game that I've created uh, inspired by different types of design thinking maps and impact maps that I've created in the work that I've done uh, with nonprofits. <laughs> it was a really long tongue. He's just a puppy. Um, thank you so much for, for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, I would love to talk to you and meet you sometime in person, um, maybe sometime at a dog park with my puppy cowboy, but I hope you all are doing well and are safe and happy. Uh, so much love, bye. Sacramento. And here we are with Amelia. Thank Hello. you so much for that, Amelia, it was great. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, one of my favorite people to talk to. I'm so glad we get to talk in front of like all of our friends. Yes. <laughs> okay. It was great seeing the behind the scenes of your hands or your feet. Uh, I think, well, first of all, I was, I was amazed to see, not amazed, because of course, but just how how a part of each part of the, the project you all were, like the mute down to the music, and of course the coding and like the art. You know, but to see you on the piano and to see Sarah on the guitar as well, recording the, the sound for the music was, was really cool. 
Yeah, yeah, I mean, right. yeah right. totally. I mean, I started off my career actually as an opera singer. And so for me, so many things start in sound. Um, I got into, like people started calling me a performance artist. I was just an opera singer composing things with like robots and code, but that was still opera to me. <laughs> I, have to, I, have to dig, I have to dig those, that, that, that documentation up. I didn't know that about you. <laughs> yeah. yeah so the first opera that I, uh, I like, I guess I'm one of the first operas that I wrote that got some critical acclaim was actually about John Titer, who is an assumed time traveler who used Whoa. to chat in like in the time period of, I guess, like around 1990, seven to 1999 something in there and he would be on all these chat forums on the early internet saying i'm john titer i'm a time traveler from i think it was 2016 actually which you know um but it was amazing so we wrote a whole opera like based on the chat room experience of this it, essentially i mean it was like a mud or like a D and D, but it was never revealed that it was a hoax. It was always just like, "This is who I am," and then all these people jumped on board and like became part of his story, which is kind of crazy. But cyberpunk operas. <laughs> that sounds really rad. I, I, I um, yeah, I've quite actually a little bit of experience with cyberpunk operas myself. Um, weird. Un unsurprised, like a niche. If it anywhere, it'd be right here. <laughs> a niche, a niche thing. Um, yeah, there's a really cool kind of like sense of humor and and just and like the what I think is interesting all, all the time is is when people in VR try to create, you know, like their people are striving and spending, you know, countless amounts of hours and time and resources trying to make perfect replicas of the real world. But it's like, why? There's <laughs> nothing will replace the real world. So to see someone make like to have like a very kind of like cartoon-esque or very kind of like visually um um, I don't know, like there's a, there's a just strong sense of aesthetic. Um, so well, I think of it like judo, right? Like it's so hard for me to brute force and convince you that you're in the matrix. This is the real world. This is the simulation, like blow your mind. It is so easy though, to do something totally ridiculous yeah. that destabilizes people enough where they're just like, whoa, look at this. I could do this crazy thing that I wouldn't normally do in the real world. And then you've already gotten inside of that playful part of them that's willing to dream with you. And if you're trying, like if you're trying as a strategy to make this whole real realistic world so that you could propose an idea that is imaginative to someone, why go through the brute force part of it? Why not start with the place they're already willing to meet you, which is like playful, new, strange, weird. It's weird to have a freaking phone on your face. You know, yeah. around. that's already weird. Like go with it. It's like judo where you're like, you're already taking that motion and just like helping it move forward. It takes so That's much cool. effort. I like that metaphor a lot. I was, I, I saw you in LA for that and gadget thing with, and I was there with Kristen Lucas. <laughs> oh, who was doing, Kristen. Who so was doing the, the flamingo, the flamingo project, yeah. which was yeah. similarly, you know, it's like, yeah, I'll dance with flamingos. I mean, of course, why wouldn't you? For sure. <laughs> um, but yeah, also another kind of, another uh, question that I had um, related to this is is um, you know you've kind of like invested a lot of time in thinking about VR specifically as a format and its ability to kind of um, you know pass on knowledge and um, what's going on with um, the health and safety of you know like public gathering and like VR headsets in the in the foreseeable future? Did we invest in the wrong technology? <laughs> no, I, will, I mean, sure, we've invested in the wrong time to be alive. I mean, let's just say that, you know, but I'm just saying, okay, you know, like I think about VR like dreams. An interesting thing that happened when me and Sarah were testing your hands on feet on a lot of different, you know, friends and relatives and, you know, people that didn't hate us who would be willing to try out this new experience. Then I'd see them later, like a couple of months later, and they'd be like, oh, you know what? I, I had this dream where, like, I was doing this thing and I was like, my hands were feet. And then they're like, oh, wait a minute. That, no, I'm sorry. That wasn't a dream. That was actually, that was your piece <laughs> yeah. you know, about this feeling. And I, I started noticing, and it wasn't one person, it wasn't two people, it was so many people started saying this to me. And I really do think that VR is like a dream technology. You're walking without walking. 
You're touching without touching. You're communing without being in the same room together. It's exactly like a dream. We don't need to go into some crazy, like imagine if the matrix, we already have this thing. It's already in our brain. And if you're an indigenous person, this is actually really strong part of your culture and part of your, your myths and your storytelling. Dream technology is a gift from the creator, right? Mm. It's a powerful thing for us to create lasting peace, okay? So if I think about VR that way, I'm not too concerned with its uh, marketability in an exhibition space. I think that it, its ultimate like place where I want to use it in my life is more like a book or like a dream. I want to be able to have this dream space, and then I want to be able to give it to someone else because, man, it's really been my whole life, I've always had these, I mean, like, I'm super lucid dreamer. I have incredible dream spaces. I'm not alone, right? Like, everyone has them. Mm-hmm. But I would love for someone to say, like, I just want to take you into my dream. I want us to yeah. have you together. I want you to dream with me or for me to be in a space of a dream world and for you to be in a space. And then we can look at each other and talk at that level. That is so powerful. And this concept of communal dreaming really comes up in a lot of cultures. And that's, I think, the real power of it. So I'm less concerned about about, like using a headset after a thousand people at an exhibition hall and more interested in how we can create and maybe it's not VR but how can we create more technology that helps us dream together and it's okay that I don't dream in my bed with every single person I know mm-hmm. yeah thank you for that reminder actually yeah I'm always also in that colonial mindset of of uh of, of technology, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good reminder just, just to realize that it is just a powerful tool for storytelling and, and co-dreaming. I like that idea. Yeah. I like that. I like that, um, antidote that you shared with us also about your friend thinking it was actually one of their dreams. Right. And I think there's something special in that piece about archetypes and sort of the way that you're playing with language in that work, which is something that we all identify with in this very core way, but it's also a visceral piece for me. And I saw for the first time in the studio with Sarah Rothberg in Brooklyn, actually. Maybe the same space where you were working. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, but but the audio in that work, and I think the sponge example at the beginning, like where you can really feel it when she runs her fingers on that sponge. But it's such a visceral part of that piece, and you know that's how you all started this conversation too, was talking about sound. Um, so talk talk to us a little bit more about storytelling and sound, and how the audio elements of that like bring forth that that sense of dreaming. Um, and really elicit those sort of things about us that are so human and innate. Oh, uh, you know, when I first started being a, 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 when I was like an artist rather than a, than a opera singer, I started having my first exhibitions in museums. The people who are the attendants of my installations and my video pieces, I would like walk in and they would give me this stink eye. And usually people are like at museums are like somewhat nice to you. They're like, oh, this is your place. Like you're the first. They would just look at me like, and it was like, it took me a little bit before I realized like when my professor said that sound is the most fascist being and like what they meant like hearing the video sound of whatever people did for like eight hours a day for two months or whatever they like wanted to kill me so I started it sounded so powerful and it's like I never have uh discounted it it's always a strategy for me and sometimes it's a strategy that can be like overused or you can learn like okay maybe I don't want to have like videos on repeat with sound and I, you know, I've, I've become a lot more uh, aware of the power of it. Um, I think in opera, we're used to like, you're only going to be there for like three to five hours, which is still a long time, but like, <laughs> it's not like eight hours a day. Um, and so, you know, when I, I've created this, this band when I was in New York um, called Lullabies for AI, at, while I was the director of this machine learning lab. And actually the people in the machine learning lab were also in this band called Lullabies for AI. And the, the reason, I guess, for needing that is we needed a space where we could both do the work of technology and like make it. And so, I mean, it barely made sense, but it made sense in the sense that we could be like this machine learning algorithm is is training on sheet music and is generating sheet music. This is like makes a little bit more linear sense. Then we needed a band where we could tell the stories that we imagined are not encapsulated in data, that don't exist in the kind of uh, uh, data lakes that we were using to train our models on, that we hoped if if we are really, our goal is to create some type of um, an AI that reflects 
our culture or it, it, it just at the bare minimum understands what humans need and, and help hopefully lets us survive right we are like how do we communicate that and so we started thinking about what do you do with a human child you know you sing lullabies to them you tell them stories you do all these things you hope in the very early stages of their life can can at least teach them what you need as well Right. And I think we do the same thing like with our animals as well. We have to be like, okay, you can bite each other like that, but like I have skin and not fur and like be gentle with me. You know, so we want to do the same kind of thing with how we think about the technology that we're building. How do we embed the humanness that isn't explicit within our database structures and has been left out either through ignorance of mission or on purpose, right? Mm -hmm. Um you're someone I look up to in terms of their um kind of like level of understanding about the need for support in artist communities. And, and, and so you, I know that, you know, we were talking years ago now about idea Rochelle and that, that residency you cultivated there as, um, as an organizer, you know, what are institutions, you know, needing to do better? What, what is something that, that idea Rochelle did that you think added to that conversation of support, you know, in, with, with other artists. Yeah, thank you so much for that question, Tommy. I mean, I'm 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 very interested in in looking at life cycles and death cycles, right? Like seeing at what point in which the the culture that you're trying to create can have the most impact. And if you can understand the whole life cycle, you can see where in that life cycle you can make impact. And then understanding at what point you are no longer valuable and and and, and designing within the structure a, a natural death cycle. And I think that's something we you know we don't do in software, you don't do in in organizations. We're just like, oh, I'm going to make this kind of impact impact forever and nothing will ever outgrow this or I'll iterate and I'll just change and change and change and change. But like, that's actually not how our natural world works. Like we have a death cycle. We have the ability to transform so radically. Like, I mean, my body will transform so radically in a thousand years that it, it won't look anything like me. So it doesn't make any sense for me to say, oh, I iterated past my, you know, human form. Like that's not, no, I died. Right. And so I think that's important too, to understand where, where our boundaries and our limits are as a, as a, as a support structure for artists? Where am I no longer going to be helpful? And knowing that keeps us real. That is so cool. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, I shouldn't say it on, on air. You know, <laughs> my death cycle. <laughs> I, mean, you know, I'm not, I don't want you to die, Tommy, but someday- My, you know, my, my, non, my non-profit death cycle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think I think nonprofits and and cultural institutions are experiencing you know a death cycle here. When but what, whether that's you know artificial or not is another question. I think that's an interesting conversation. Yeah, and Barry says rebirth cycle in the chat. Absolutely, there you know that yeah. that's okay too, right? Like a total rebirth. Also, like giving over something to another group, being like I created this so that this group could do something. Now maybe it's their turn to then move forward. And I've had a couple, you know, I, I'm always interested in helping um, indigenous youth and, and figuring out in my life how I can make the most impact to help indigenous youth. And I've worked with other people who are like, I, I used to have, run a nonprofit where I helped indigenous youth. And now I want to help an indigenous person help indigenous youth. And I'm like, that's pretty awesome. That like you knew that and you timed that in your life and you're like, I've done this for five years and now it's actually time for me to me not to be the leader and now I'm going to help someone else. That's pretty cool. Should we take a, a I was just I was just checking I was just checking on an audience question so it might just be a second or two before we get something in here um, but you know I think that one of the things that Amelia and I were talking about ahead of time too is threading together some of the work and we just saw Morrison's work and we were having conversations in the lounges and this idea of um, cultural storytelling right um, and you talked a little bit about in the presentation decentralized storytelling and I wonder if you can just talk a little bit more about that for you in your practice. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, and, and I was asked uh, on Monday, I was I gave a talk at the um, Emmerman Center for Technology at Connecticut College. And someone asked me, what does decentralization mean? And I, I remembered in that moment that, you know, I use frequently terms from my, you know, sort of like hacker technology universe, um, you know, my cyberpunk opera background. Right. Um, 
in order to explain parts about my indigenous culture. And mm -hmm. I do that because I'm a technologist and an artist, right? And so I'm kind of like trying to translate as a bridge between these two groups. And so I said, you know, I didn't invent the term decentralization. I, I know you both know that because you're technologists, but, I, I, but I'm like, I wanted to take that same idea, which was really an ethos that was in the early, you know, periods of the internet where people were saying, what if we were a decentralized network of nodes? What if we had communication mm -hmm. systems that were not centralized through a government utility or through an enormous corporation and and that that like ethos hasn't actually gone away maybe it's gotten smaller maybe it's gotten bigger but it's still a call to action that a lot of technologists resonate with and i'm like you know that thing is really similar to something that existed before colonization and so maybe it's not a new idea but it's a calling back to something that's really true on this soil like that idea maybe came from this soil and maybe it's because it has always been here right we tell us a little bit about this um this project or work you're doing with with media lab sure yeah wampum.code so the reason I use the, the phrase wampum is wampum is a type of a shell that we have in our culture. It's it's binary, it's purple or it's white. And we make beads into it that are purple or white. And we use them in order to record decentralized contracts of agreements that are created through storytelling based consensus. And we weave them into something called a wampum belt. Our uh, great law of peace, which is our constitution, was made into one of these wampum belts. And Thomas Jefferson and George Washington actually made their own wampum belt after living with our tribe and learning with them for about a year to show that they understood our system of contract building and consensus. Um, but even from the very beginning, you could see that our wampum belt is like uh, the great uh, tree of peace is in the middle. And then each of the nodes that comes out of it are squares that represent each of the tribes. And theirs was in the middle was a house. And then each node that came off and represented a singular man. So it's like so different, right? Even from the very, they're like, we understand the wampum part. We understand the weaving part. But they like missed the whole decentralized communalism, which is interesting to and the center yeah. both being on nature. So it was like very interesting that even they're like, we got it. And we're like, oh, so close, you know. But it so that's the wampum part. And then the part that I'm doing with um with MIT is I I'm doing this podcast where I'm interviewing indigenous technologists and and in co-creating these ideas and gathering this wisdom that I hope to turn into it, it's it's an idea for how you could embed explicitly your values and ethics into your software. So, um, you know, I use the exam example of like a package uh, .json where you say these are all the dependencies that this software package needs to run. What if one of those dependencies was what I might the ethics I believe need to exist for this software to function? Right now, the only ethical decision that I can make is do I use like the GNU license, do I use the MIT license, or do I close source that? And that's based on copyright law. It's not even based on values or ethics. It does have values and ethics in it because the law is something that contains our values and ethics. But how do I make my own values and ethics explicit that are based in a consensus-based community? So that's the project I'm doing. Really cool. Yeah, you you actually mentioned you said this word blockchain in your in your video, and I was like, well, I haven't heard that word in a year. Yeah. And, and I heard it like every day a year oh, ago, yeah. and now and now, but 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 this idea of wampum has has transcended, you know. And even an erasure of of people of indigenous peoples um, by by this by our by our, by this people um, by the United States. Um, so just interesting to kind of see that that idea, you know. Live well, I like to say that if the Constitution was made after the Iroquois Confederacy, our matrilineal matriarchal Confederate democracy, and then it was it was you know, forked and a new version was created, the source code has something valuable. And maybe we just have some malware we need to like. <laughs> <laughs> Love that idea. Well, uh -huh. any questions, feel free to, to, um, to chat in the chat. Yeah, um, I'm checking out the Q and A right now to see if we have any. Yeah. You could also find me on Twitter. I'm at Amelia WB. Um, happy to answer your questions later on. Um, so the, uh, you know, th there's like a sense of humor that is that is you know felt in in um, your hands or your feet. I think you know that is like 
it reminds me a lot of like maybe themes in the stupid hackathon that you co-created with Sam Levine. Can you tell us a little bit about, about that project? Yeah, totally. Um, I think my favorite phrase ever to have happen out of the stupid hackathon is on Hacker News, like the one day we were like the number one thing trending on Hacker News. Someone was like, who gave you permission to do this? Yeah. And me and Sam were like, what? <laughs> we're upset. <laughs> We're like, what? And they're like, well, I mean, hacking. right, right. Do we disgrace hacking? And they were like, what do you get some kind of certificate or something that lets you just decide that you could stupidly hack? So we, of course, made this certificate, obviously, and you could download it. But I loved that idea of like, who gave you permission? And yeah. I, I guess I'm very proud that we gave people permission to do something stupid when it comes to technology, whereas other people have been doing it without permission. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I just, I, you know, I think that it is true that sometimes you just need a container and then you can say, hey, people, fill, fill this up and you get some really real feelings about the world that they're immersed in. You kind of have to say to people, do you know that we're inside of the ocean and we're swimming it? And the other fish are like, OK, yeah, I got feelings about this ocean, you know, and so I, I feel like that's what the stupid hackathon was. It was really a space where people were given permission to talk about the weird things they were noticing. And they said, well, it's it's not fair because in the stupid hackathon, you're allowed to talk about sexism and racism and stupid things. And we were like, yeah, yeah, I guess. What, you were, what are some of the highlight projects that, that came out of that? Is it is it over a, a couple days or something? Yeah, well, usually we always have the stupid hackathon one day. You came there in the morning and you, and like the only parameter really is that you had to make something that quote unquote worked, like it did a thing. Like if if its goal was to take Soylent and make it pink and then charge twice the price so that it was like, you know, pinkified Soylent, if it did that, then like that's that, that that, that worked. Like it, a thing that you said was gonna happen, happened. That's like kind of the whole parameter. And we would give sort of um, like buckets of categories as ways that people could think about these, uh, these stupid, stupid, stupid ideas. Um, and, you know, some of the categories would just be simple where they'd be like the internet of things. Like, isn't that already kind of stupid? I don't know, like, you know, just kind of say these ideas and people would make incredible things. And a lot of people would say, this is the very first time I've ever engaged with X technology, but I was afraid to because I didn't know what to do. But, you know, everyone knows how to make something that's stupid and no one needs and is a terrible yeah. idea. Yeah. Um, you know? <laughs> but but it's, and, and, and we didn't set off to make it uh, necessarily a political commentary, but people felt safe that they could do that. And, and I'm really proud of that. And the fact that we, we never had less than 50% women and, and female identifying people in our hackathons. And I actually, this one other hackathon, which will remain nameless on the stream, tried to sue us and saying that they did a, a stupid ish. I won't say the name, but like a, a funny hackathon uh, before us, which they actually didn't, they did it two years after us and that we should stop doing ours. And the reason we should stop doing ours is because people had criticized them for having like 90% men and only men with the mic and only men leadership and that we were making them look bad. And I was like, well, that's stupid. Yeah, there's still some really awful people in this world. It's really sad. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. I think it, like I, I, I think the easiest way to get more diverse people in a hackathon is to you know do it with them because they're your friends and to give them the mic and let them you know, do what they want to do. Yeah, diversity is, is a really big problem for for some people. Or like or like uh, it's really challenging for people to imagine um, a world where you know creators don't look like them or uh, they really just they're they're lazy. They're 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 not. You know, they're not doing their homework. They're not making friends that aren't white. Yeah, no, I told them, I said, why don't you just give uh, one of your friends who's a woman the mic and then she can lead the hackathon. And they were like, well, we don't really know. And I was like, any women? <laughs> yeah, it's ridiculous. Um, so we do have a question from the audience and, and they just want to hear you talk more about music and sound. So the question is over here in the, in the sidebar. Um, talking about speaking to metaphors to bring visuals in the VR experience, how do you approach uh, metaphors and music and sound as well in this process? Yeah, I mean, you know, there, and I think Sarah touched a little bit on it in the video, this kind of concept of seeds and stems, or if you're thinking about it as a logic tree that you have like branches and then you have other leaves that come off of those branches, which is just kind of your basic way of, of thinking of um, something that's 
like fractal-like or generative or algorithmic can help you design something that's still very deep and meaningful. It doesn't have to just be like, you know, oh, I don't know, just a MIDI variable from one to a hundred and it'll map to this thing. I don't care. Right. And we've all kind of experienced that kind of generative music. And you're like, oh, I wave my hand and things happen. But if I wave my hand in a different way, well, similar things happen that I can't actually notice the difference. That's, you know, that's not, that's not as enough feedback. I think we have such developed senses of sound and and sensuality and pleasure around music that I think it it becomes a lot of fun because rather than writing a song once, I can write a song a hundred times and do all of the sort of variations. And then you, my incredible viewer gets to be a part of the central world that I built. And I think it's super fun for me as a creator to build those spaces. But I also, you know, I'm like very critical when I go in spaces, I want to feel that too. I want to feel like my presence has touched this in such a way. And that I think is the closest thing we can do to mirror that live experience when I am singing on stage for a group of 100 people like I am so with them like our atoms are our, our, our every bit of our bodies are vibrating together and they are a part of this music as much as I am we are actually creating it in this moment that's my cue our sidekicks can we bring our sidekicks it's uh it's chewing on a, a squeaky toy <laughs> this is cowboy oh. <laughs> it's like I'm making a sound. Always better with buddies. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, thank you so much for your time today, Amelia. We really appreciate you being a part of Radical Simulation. Love this chat. I'm glad you two got a chance to also reconnect via. Oh, love you, Tommy. So here. good. Yeah, I love you too. Come back and see us. Yeah. Um, and just safe. before we cut um, for the day, I want to um, just prepare our audience as we move into our evening portion.